my name is Chris Cantrell. I work in production over at Riot Games, which is a video game company down in Los Angeles, primarily known for making this game, League of Legends. Uh, <laughs> I actually haven't worked on League in a few years. Instead, I've been working on this, Mechs vs. Minions. And Mechs vs. Minions and League are similar in that they're both games, they're both from the same world as far as our, our lore and IP is concerned, but the primary difference is that while League of Legends is a video game, Mechs vs. Minions was designed for your tabletop. And I think initially this decision for, for Riot to make a, a board game probably blindsided some people. To be frank, I think it probably blindsided some people internally at Riot. <laughs> and why would a, a video game company, known more for this, decide to make this? And I guess that's what I want to talk to you about today, to go over the story of, of, of Next First Minions development from my perspective. I was the product owner and a part of the design team. And so I'd like to go over the three-year timeline that I went on to get this game made. I'd like to talk about how we, how we leveraged our, our, our video game development experience and, 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 and talk about some of the design crossroads we encountered and what motivated us as we kind of uh, came to choose one path or the next. And finally, at the end, I, I'd, I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about the why. You know, why did we make this game? Why was it you know, so important to us? Uh, and to be honest, if, if this talk feels a little bit light on uh, complex game theory and heavier on, on the motivations behind the experiential design of Mechs vs. Minions, that's probably because that's where I found our learnings to be the most noteworthy or, or, or compelling. And, and it's such an honor to be here. Uh, I, I, I'll be honest, I'm really proud to tell this story. It's the story of a video game company trying to learn how to make a board game. And that story, Starts with this man, Stone LeBrandy. So some of you might recognize Stone. He's taught uh, game design classes here at GDC for over a decade. But in addition to being a very prolific video game designer, Stone also, as like a hobby, designs board games for his family. Like every year, year over year, he'd, he'd sit down and he'd create a new board game and he'd show it to his family and, and they would all play it at, at Christmas or whatnot. And, and it's exciting to me that the story starts with Stone because in a bit I hope to explain why Riot decided to make a board game. And honestly, I'm, I'm not sure if that answer is going to make any sense unless I can really convey to you what it was that was motivating Stone when he would make these games for his family. So over the years, he made a lot of these games, and one of them, the, the one that Mechs vs. Minions is based on, was called WZD, for Weapons of Zombie Destruction. Now, WZD was a competitive programming game where you would take these little cards and put them on a command line, and that would cause this little robot to to walk around and kill this, this room full of zombies. And that was basically it. There were like 100 zombies on the board at setup, and whoever killed the most won. Well, fast forward to about three years ago, Stone was looking to join Riot. And he was talking to someone that he'd worked with at a previous studio, and they're like, hey, Stone, do you remember that WZD game? Stone was like, yeah. He was like, we should have Riot make that. And Stone laughed at him. I mean, in his eyes, it was absurd that, that a video game company might, might actually want to make a board game. And he told him that. And the guy was like, no, I'm serious. I, I really think this is something that Riot could get behind. And, and so Stone was like, look, I, I'd be happy to give you the design, and I'll, I'll even help out and consult on it if you want. But if you're bringing me in to work at Riot, I'd, I'd rather the role that I'm being brought on for be you know, focused on making video games. I'm sure he was worried about the little things in life, like job security. <laughs> and uh, if we're being completely honest, I'm sure on some level he, he <laughs> He wondered what poor fool they would find to drive on the development of this project that would probably never see the light of day. And so that's about the time that I enter the story. Uh, just, just some backstory on me. I, I joined Riot about two years earlier, so about five years ago today, as a gameplay analyst. It was my first job in games. Uh, and a gameplay analyst is just a fancy way of saying that I played the latest balance changes and, and, and champions on League and then gave my feedback on them to the designers. Uh, eventually, I got promoted to be an associate QA analyst on, on the champion team, and then I moved over to the release team, which is the team at Riot that gets our, our patches out to our players, uh, as a release manager. And then, my wife and I, we, we had our first child, who we named Avalon. So, Don Eskridge, if you're watching this, if you name your next child Mechs First Minions, my wife says she'll consider a square. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And, and then I came back from paternity leave and I joined this area of Riot that kind of focused on um, unconventional ways to explore our IP as an associate producer. And so here I am, some, some guy who'd never been a producer before, who'd never even had any direct reports, 
and I just got offered to create my own game at Riot. And I was stoked. <laughs> I mean, it didn't matter to me that it was a, a board game instead of a video game. It didn't matter to me that I, I was terrified beyond belief or felt completely underqualified. I was just like, yeah, I'm making a game, you know, I was, I was living the dream. And look, I, I don't want to belabor my inadequacies here because, you know, I do know the space. I love board games. I, I love the mark they leave on us as people. I love the way they, they, they impact our relationships and, and help shape our culture. You know, some of my earliest memories are, are, are sitting down to, to play chess with my dad or, or Stratego or Risk or, or Axis and Allies. I, I, I love that board games provide a venue for, for families to create those types of memories or, or an outlet for friends who are you know, just looking to hang out. Um, so I guess you could say, while I'd never been a producer before, what, what I lacked in experience, I tried my best to make up for in enthusiasm or passion. And I remember, I, I sat down to play WZD for the first time, and it just didn't click for me. I mean, I, I liked it. I loved parts of it. I, I just, you know, I wasn't all that eager to keep playing it again and again. And, and here's the thing, I, I could look around the table and just see in the eyes of the other folks that everyone else, it just clicked. They got it, you know? So I, I knew there was something awesome there. I, I just didn't think I could, I could see it yet. And I thought, I was embarrassed. You know, I, I thought I was a fraud. And so what I, what I tried to do was I tried to look just as objectively as I knew how at this game, uh, because there were things that I liked about it. Like it had a, a lot of the same elements that I loved about Richard Garfield's masterpiece, Robo Rally. But it also had some things that kind of separated, it some, separated itself from Robo Rally that I really appreciated. Like it was a bit more hack and slash feel as opposed to a race, you know. Stone, Stone had managed to kind of capture this, this visceral feeling of killing all of these zombies, like, like that moment in Dead Rising where you're kind of wandering through like a, a parking garage, just killing zombies. There's something viscerally right-brained to offset the more analytical nature that comes with programming out your command line. So you get a little bit of the of, of both types of gamers there with, with, with that approach. And in game design, we like to talk about this thing called power growth fantasy, which is when you go on this journey from starting weak to growing to be you know, very powerful, which is just like it sounds, I guess, power growth fantasy. And, and Stone had managed to incorporate elements of that by leaving the cards that you would, you would place to program your mech to kind of grow as, as the game progressed instead of wiping them at the end of the round. So you could feel your, your, your little robot grow into this powerful zombie killing machine. But still, like, even with all of that, from like a timeline perspective, I went from about here to here, like months of time, just sort of going through the motions. You know, being more excited with the idea that I got to make a game than actually being excited with, with where that game was at. And eventually, I kind of brought this to, to my manager, a, a guy who, who also happens to be my mentor. And, and I told him that, that, I, that I was making a game that I wasn't really excited to play. And I was pretty sure that when I told him this, <laughs> uh, while I didn't think I'd be fired, I was pretty, he'd be forced to kind of take me off the project. And instead, what he, what he told me was that it didn't matter if it clicked for anyone else or not, that I shouldn't be the product owner for a game that, that didn't click for me. And he encouraged me to go back to Stone and kind of talk through the portions of the game that I, I wanted to workshop. And when I did, Stone was completely ready to collaborate and was even excited to like, watch his design evolve. And, and I bring this story up because I ultimately learned something that proved to be very valuable to me that I hope I have the courage to remember throughout the rest of my career. And that's that you and everyone else on your team will do your best work if you if you really believe in what you're making. You know, there's a, a, a craftsmanship, an artisanship that, that, that comes with passion that's just impossible to fake. Or at the very least, I've found that, that I am unable to fake it. And so, kind of newly invigorated, I, I, I went and I, I started working on the game in earnest. And, and for the large part, it was by myself. I mean, I'd go and I'd rope in a, a group of random play testers and, and I'd play with them and I'd take their feedback and I'd kind of make some changes and, and they'd go on their way and then I'd, I'd go and I'd rope up an, another group of play testers and then I'd kind of do the same thing, just rinse and repeat, you know? And this was very beneficial because in game design, you, you have to do frequent play tests. That's the, that's the, the meat and the bones of, of game design. Everything else is just kind of theory crafting, right? Uh, and, and I'm, I'm very fortunate that at Riot we have a lot of you know, hardcore board game players that I, I, I could pull from. But I ultimately look back on, on this era of the development and I, I see it as one of my biggest mistakes. 
See, the thing is, um, you know, just by nature of them all being different people, each, each playtester had a, had a different idea of what the eventual game might look like. You know, so I, I talked to this group, and they'd be like, oh, yeah, I, I think the game wants to be here, and I, I work towards that, and then, and then I'd work towards this, and I'd work towards this, and this, and, and, I, and I ended up with a very scattered design. And I didn't recognize it at the time. You know, I, it wasn't until later in the process that I had a, a, a core group of playtesters that, that I could see the difference. And I'll, I'll get to that in a bit, but for now, just know that eventually every design is, is going to have to withstand the, the, the scrutiny of, of, of public opinion. Uh, but initially, when, when you first start working on it, it's actually very healthy to have a, a very core group of playtesters that you trust until you understand what the game wants to be. So by around February 2015, I, I had felt that I had brought the game to about as far as I'd be able to take it. And I was ready to move into production. And my stakeholders, they were ready for the project to be over. <laughs> and so I told them that the, that the design was about locked, right? But I still have my doubts. I and mean, what if it wasn't any good, right? And so not knowing anyone in the board game industry, I decided to turn to the two people that I turned to as a player when it's time for me to purchase a game. I, I talked to Tom Vassell of Dice Tower and Quentin Smith of Shut Up and Sit Down. And I reached out to them and I asked them if they'd be interested in coming in and, and, and play testing it and telling me if I was gonna embarrass myself or not. And I think both of them were a little bit taken aback. I mean, Tom had, had never heard of Riot or, or League of Legends and, and Quentin was even pretty adamant that we didn't really need him. What we needed to do was find a designer. And I told him pretty candidly that I'd already had a lot of designers come and play test the game. I, I just didn't know if players would like it. And so he agreed to come take a look. But Tom came out first, and, and I, I remember, <laughs> we were so nervous. Uh, he, he, he gave us a lot of really insightful things to do around the game to kind of make it feel more streamlined, like a first player marker and, and how to make the turns go quicker and the like. And a, after a, a long day of play test, his guy, he was like, guys, I don't know why you're so nervous. I, you know, I, I play a lot of prototypes, and this one's actually pretty far along. I, I think you have a game on your hands. We were like, really? He was like, yeah. So we were like, okay, well, thank you very much, Mr. Vassal, and, and he went on his way, and we were stoked. <laughs> like, we were strutting around, you know, doing high fives, and I remember someone even asked, like, do we, do we still want Quentin to come out and, and play it, you know, now that we have Tom Vassal's approval, and I was like, well, yeah, because I'd never been, you know, more confident in the game, or, or <laughs> and, you know, his, his flights were already booked, and, I, and I, I really wanted to meet him. I'm, I'm a fan of his work. So Quentin came out and played it a couple weeks later, and, 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 and he was less enthusiastic. <laughs> I mean, he said he liked it, but he, he wasn't sure why, why he would get it to the table again when it compared to everything else in his collection, which, you know, wasn't what we wanted to hear. <laughs> and then he started talking about, you know, about mice and mystics and, and descent and imperial assault and, and, and a campaign where you would kind of take this, this, this core uh, where, where the game could evolve and with scenarios where you would take the core programming thing, like Stone's thing, and build something on top of it with missions and hazards and, and, and a narrative. And you could just tell that as he was describing it, you could look around the room and, and see in the eyes of everyone that like the game he was describing was just so much better than the game we had made. And, and in that moment, with everyone else listening wistfully to that beautiful British accent, you know, the, the full situation kind of dawned on me. You know, to, to make the game the way that Quentin was describing, I would basically have to design 10 games instead of one. That's a lot more games. Remember, my stakeholders, they think I'm almost finished. <laughs> so I went back to my, to my, to my mentor and, and I kind of told him what I'd learned and what I wanted to do and what I, what I was afraid to do. And, and he was like, look, if you believe in it, then, then make your case to your stakeholders. <laughs> and right. I was like, well, look, I mean, it's already been a year and a half. If I, if I go to the CEO and I tell him I want to reboot the design, he'll probably just cancel the project. And he was like, possibly. You know, Maybe even probably, but you know, Chris, what's the alternative? Do you really want to make a game that you yourself don't believe in? So I updated my LinkedIn profile and I, <laughs> I, went, I went back to my stakeholders and, 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 and I told them I wanted to reboot the design, you know, that I, I wanted to do missions and a campaign and, and 10, 10 different missions and, and, and a story that would kind of evolve. And, and I just kind of laid out my vision for the pro for the project just kind of as articulately as I knew how. I was pretty confident that they were just gonna cancel the project. And, well, they didn't, you know. 
And I guess in retrospect, I suspect they saw something in me that maybe I wasn't looking for at the time. See, I, I look in the mirror and I see my failures, you know, but they, they looked past my, my lack of experience and saw someone that, that, that really thought that this was the best way that we, we could go forward, that this, you know, was how we could best provide value to our players. So they took a look at my prototype pieces and my prototype art for my prototype game and, and, and we're like, okay, hurry please, but okay. So I hurried. And it was pretty clear to me that if I was gonna get this designed in time, I needed more design help. So I brought in Rick Ernst, who ended up becoming the lead designer on MVM. And the two of us worked together to kind of create a, a series of scenarios uh, and, and, and mapped out kind of the arc of, of, of the story and the campaign. And then Rick came up with the idea of, of a damage deck and, and communally drafting the, the command card since we decided to go fully cooperative. And, and the two of us just focused on, on, on these daily iterations, this kind of rapid iteration. Don't be afraid to fail, but do it fast. We needed more play testers, so we brought in both Nathan Tyrus and Prashant Saraswat, and the four of us became this core play test group. And if I could offer one piece of advice to people who are, who are in the middle of play testing their own games right now, it's to do targeted play tests. That's when, at, at the very beginning of a play test, you, you write down what it is you want to focus on for that play test. And it could be anything. It could be game length or tension or, or a new mechanic that you've introduced. But have a very clear focus for that play test. And then, at the end of the play test, revisit it and, and, and see what you've learned. It sounds like such a subtle shift, and it felt like one. But what ended up happening, coming out of it, was that instead of us talking kind of empathetically about like, ah, oh, this felt bad or this felt bad, we started talking much more strategically around the direction of the game and, and kind of where it was heading. And the game started kind of driving toward this, this single coherent vision. Both Nathan and Prashant kind of joined us from, from a background in QA. Um, and, and they brought with them this, this like years of practice over, over at League on, on how to properly play test a game. And, and it was like night and day compared to the like wandering around in the desert that I did by myself. Um, so just keep that in mind. That, like, Eventually, you do want to be able to open it up, but, but you know, and I, I don't think that that's the only, the only example of, of Riot kind of leveraging our, our, our video game making know-how and, and applying it to the tabletop space. I think another good example of that is that we decided to publish the game ourselves. And I'll tell you firsthand that dealing with the nightmare that is global logistics is not the easiest way to do it, but at this point, we're just kind of used to figuring it out as we went. And we got some benefits from this approach that I think you see us leveraging in both League of Legends uh, and MVM. For one, it allows us to, to talk candidly with our players. A lot of times when a, when a designer gives a game to a, to a publisher, it's the, the publisher that controls the messaging of the game. So sometimes the, the, the des a designer, oftentimes even a, a really big name designer, isn't encouraged to kind of talk candidly about what they've learned in their process or, or even answer basic rules questions. Well, Riot, being both a, a, a publisher and, and a distributor, has taken a different approach over the years with League, and I was eager to kind of apply those learnings to this new space. And, and to be clear, that's not unique to us. A lot of the most successful Kickstarter games out there really leverage community engagement in very inventive and creative ways. Another benefit that we got from uh, self-publishing was that we had greater control over the quality that we were going to be able to provide to players. You know, a somewhat prevailing misconception was that, that Mexfirst Minions was just made at a loss, which isn't true. We actually make a very similar profit margin, I assume, as, as other board game publishers. But the difference is we, we just took all of the money that is typically allotted to like distribution and licensing out an IP and, and, and the retail markup, and we poured all of that back in to making higher quality uh, game components. So we opted to, to paint the pieces and, and, and look for opportunities to kind of push the envelope a few places in that way. Because at this point, we, we didn't just want to make a, a game, we wanted to make an experience. You know? I remember, <laughs> uh, when I first started on the project, I, I, I watched a YouTube video of, of Rob Davio as he was giving a, a, a talk right after he'd launched Risk Legacy. And in the talk, he talked about, that's him in the corner there, <laughs> and in the talk he talked about um, how they had done skin conductivity tests on a group of board game players over at MIT. And what they found was that board game players are the most excited when they play a board game when they sit down to open the box. And then they go to like learn the rules, and that's, that's like where fun goes to die. 
and, and to be clear, I, I, I stole that joke like beat for beat from, from Rob Davio's Risk Legacy presentation like years ago. <laughs> and, and so I thought on that, like, and I recognize how absurd this sounds, but I, I, I just thought of all the boxes in my life that I really enjoyed opening. And, and, and the touchstone that I landed on was that moment when you first open up an iPhone. You know, every piece is kind of thoughtfully engineered in its own specific place. And, and, and for me, it, it created like this moment of, of, of ceremony uh, and attention to detail. Because if, if Apple cares so much about getting these arguably trivial details perfect, then it kind of conveys a sense of, of, of craftsmanship, of artisanship that carries over to the final product long after you've forgotten about the packaging. And for me, that made even more sense to, to get it right on, on a board game because in a board game, you, you keep the packaging. You, know? you, you don't throw it out. You, you have to engage with it each time you, you interact with the product. And so just standing on the shoulders of giants here, I, I, I leveraged Rob Davio's learnings and I brought it over to Noah Adelman over at Game Trays. And the two of us came up with this idea to create a series of trays that would really maximize the, the, that, that, that first moment of engagement. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting thing, because you could really tell that, that the team was really starting to see the game take shape. Like we'd say, like our, like our mantra, you know, we'll, we'll probably never be able to make a game like this again, so let's just make the best game that we can in this moment. And we pushed ourselves. And, and after hours and hours of, of play tests and banging our head against the wall and squashing minions, we landed with a game that, that we were excited to show the rest of the world. And then on October 13th, 2016, at, at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, we, we launched the game. Uh, not sure if anyone in the world would care that some video game company had decided to, to make a board game completely in-house. And so that's the story. That's the three-year timeline that I went on to get this game made. It, it amounts to me surrounding myself with far more talented people. And I guess it ends with me getting up here to speak to you guys on their behalf. It's an odd thing. After we shipped the game, uh, <laughs> there, there, were, there seemed to be a, a common sentiment that like, oh yeah, of course, Riot can make a high-quality board game. They probably had like a billion people working on it. Um, and the truth is, that it was really just this handful of people. And, and each of these people, myself included, were all fully dedicated to other projects while we were working on it. And with the exception of, of Chris Matthew over at Panda and, and Noah, the lot of us had, had practically no board game development experience between all of us. It, just to kind of hit on a theme here, um, what we lacked in experience, we, we tried to make up for in, in passion. Uh, but I don't feel like I've really answered my main question. Why did Riot decide to make a board game? You know, was, it, was it because we wanted to actualize the potential of an untapped market in the League of Legends or hobbyist board game mind space? No. <laughs> did, we, did we want to optimize our user acquisi acquisition and, and minimize churn by, by leveraging unconventional retention stratagems? <laughs> uh, no, that wasn't it either. Uh, I think the truth is we just we wanted to make a game that we, that we thought our players would like. You know, for the same reason that, that Stone would come home after, after a long day of working at the office, making games, and sit down and, and create something for his family. We wanted to make a game that, well, that we thought our players might like. And I guess for me personally, I, I wanted to make something that, that one day I could play with my daughters. I'd like to end with this quote from one of my favorite storytellers. It's actually very sim similar to something I heard Mark and Brandon, the founders of Riot, talk about when, when they first started you know, thinking about the idea of, of, of Riot and League of Legends and, and, and talking to various angel investors. And at the time, kind of the, the general sentiment was that uh, PC games were dead. <laughs> Facebook games, th those were the future. If you want to turn this League of Legends thing into a Facebook game, then we'll invest in your company. Uh, <laughs> Like the general sentiment was go broad instead of go deep. But Mark and Brandon, they, they really believed in this market in large part because they were a part of it. They were part of this small niche Warcraft 3 mod community and, and they'd landed on a game that excited them. And that mattered more. You know, re reaching this, this handful of people in a very passionate way, that, that mattered more. You know, these days, League of Legends has like 100 million players every month, and, and, and even a very successful board game might only sell 15,000 units in its entire lifetime. 
So if our real goal was just to reach as many people as we could, we probably would have been a lot better off well, not making a board game, or, or if we made a board game just like leveraging our IP to kind of get something that had broader public appeal, like uh, League of Legends Monopoly. Uh, but going broad was never our goal. It was so much more important to us to really resonate in a, in a core way with a handful of people than it was to, to reach a broader audience in a less impactful way. Look, I, I knew that, I know that Next First Minions is not a game for everybody, and I'm okay with that. Uh, but when I, when I was making it, I, I thought of this imaginary person that I hoped would be out there, that when they got it, they, they would be as passionate about it as, as we were when we were making it. And so I, I'd like to, I'd like to end with, with this. Um, each of us in this room have only a finite number of projects that we'll ever be able to work on. So if you take nothing else from this talk, I implore you, take this. Use your finite time to make something that you are proud of, that pushes you, that, that, that you can pour your heart into and swing for the fences and that terrifies you just a little bit, pushing you outside your comfort zone. Look, I, I, I don't know if that will ultimately lead to a game that, that that everyone wants to play or not, but I do know that that game, that's a game that I'd want to play. Thanks. And I think we have about four minutes. I'm, I'm close to time, but uh, if you know, anyone wants to talk, then I, I can answer questions now, or we can go out and do it in the break on room. All right, then. Oh. Uh, I, think, I think they want you to talk to in, into a microphone, or if you say it, then I'll just repeat the question. I can make that work. Uh, I just had a random question, but someone else put it in their hand. What is your favorite League of Legends champion? What is my favorite League of Legends champion? Uh, my, my favorite League of Legends champion is probably Soraka. I, I, I like, like bananas a lot? I, I do. I, I played her since beta uh, as, as a mid and a top, like pretty, pretty aggressive. I played kind of in an unconventional way of doing it. I'm gonna go with this guy just because he's at the microphone, but if, if you wanna to go to the mic, then I'll. Hi, uh, great talk. I'm curious, you mentioned that you know you tried pulling in random people for playtests, and you felt like you learned less from them than when you had a dedicated group of playtesters. And to me, that's, that's really interesting because it seems to be like backwards from what I know from video games, which is like, oh yeah, you wanna bring in new people because they don't have exposure and that they're gonna be seeing things for the first time. Yeah. I'm curious, what, was, what did you find that you got from the dedicated playtest group that you didn't get from brand new people? So I, I think over the, the trajectory of a, of, a, of a game's kind of development life cycle, uh, you definitely wanna get to a point where you wanna get it to as many eyes as you can. Uh, so th that's, that's not untrue. But I think uh, the point I was trying to make is that if you, if you do that too early in the process, you end up creating a lot of different types of games. And, and, and it's not very, for me, I felt like it wasn't a very cohesive vision. Uh, and I, I've, I've seen that elsewhere in Riot. We, we try to kind of compartmentalize the, the R&D efforts uh, or, or whatnot. Thank you. Uh, hello. <clears throat> hello there. Hi. Uh, first of all, as a League of Legends player, I do care, so <laughs> thank you. Um, second of all, uh, in the League of Legends community, I was talking with people as Mechs vs. Minions was announced and it came out. <clears throat> Sorry, I got a cold. Um, one of the prevailing things I th saw was there were a bunch of people going, oh wow, this is so incredible, and then other people were going, ugh, yordles. Um, <laughs> have you... <laughs> I, well, it comes back to your thing, it's going to be the game that people want. but. Um, have, I know you said that if we're, we're probably never going to do something like this again. Have you ever considered doing something like this again or expanding it? Or I, I know it's, you just said no, but... No, I, uh, uh, we're, we're not currently working on any other board games right now. Uh, I, I think, you know, never say never. We're always listening to our players. And, and you know, if there's a sentiment that, like, there's, there's a community for this, then I think that's something that Riot tends to listen to their players on. Uh, and as far as the Ordals go, um, it's funny because we, when, I, when I first originally kind of came up with like pairing uh, the, the game, one of the things that, that I found was that uh, we use like Oriana and Blitzcrank and some of our more sentient robots uh, from League in, in, in the game. Uh, and it felt very frustrating when like Blitzcrank would run into a wall, uh, whereas like when we, when we moved it to Yordles, it felt silly and whimsical and it kind of created this moment of laughter as opposed to just frustration. Uh, and, and, and I thought that the Yordles really kind of 
helped convey that event. Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, was it always cooperative? Um, no. Did you no. want to do that to kind of balance the universe? No. We, we, we started with a competitive game, and, and we switched to, co to cooperative in, in part because um, I found that the game could be very spiky when it was competitive. Like if someone drafted the cards that you really wanted, uh, or, or if they got cards that like really helped make their, it was like the cards that were dictating uh, success or failure. And as soon as we made it collaborative, then it was, it was kind of a point of tension, like, oh, I really need this, oh, I need this too. That's fine, you take it, I'll, I'll figure something else out. And like, it, it kind of created a really neat kind of cooperative engagement. I, I personally really like cooperative games and board games because like in League, I, I, there, there are like millions of players that are playing at any one time, so if I want to get on and I want to play like a game that's kind of balanced, we have matchmaking to do that. But you know, if I sit down with like my, my, my wife or, or if, I, if I sit down with like, you know, my, my grandparents, like there's a wide range of people where like if you and I were sitting down and playing chess right now and you were like, and you just crushed me, I'd be like, oh, well, do you want to play again? You'd be like, sure. And then you just crush me again. And I'd be like, oh, well, do you want to play again? And you'd be like, well, not, not really. And I'd be like, yeah, me neither. And, and I, I think, I think with matchmaking, you kind of avoid that. Uh, and in cooperative games, instead of like having a friend who's much more talented than you at the game, it actually becomes a benefit as opposed to kind of a detriment. And so th those were some of the thoughts on, on my work. As a follow-up, did you guys kind of consider this to be a, a detriment to the league player base? Because they're obviously very competitive and just no. that alone would did, like... No, uh, and, and the reason why is league is a competitive game, but league is also a cooperative game, you know? Like in order to really succeed at league, you need to get good at, at teamwork and kind of working with your teammates, and that's that's an element of that game too. So if we made a competitive game, like that's that's an aspect of it. But you know, so is so is cooperation. Thank you. Yeah, no, no worries. Um, so I will almost have the opposite of that question. Do you think the relationship with Riot and League has helped sales of the game somewhat? And can we assume the fact that you're saying you'll probably never do something like this again mean that it's hasn't taken right by storm, or is it just pocket money compared to league? So I, I, I didn't hear the second question. I'm sorry. Um, can, can we assume the fact that you um, you said you're probably never going to do something like this again? Right. Um, can we take that to mean that it hasn't taken riot by storm, and therefore you, you just? I, I, I think I think riot is is very proud of the game. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we're just always looking at the next hill and, and trying to find the next thing that kind of pushes us, and, and that's 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 more the sentiment right now. But you know, I, I loved working on this project, um, and you know, the idea of, of making more games in this fashion is very appealing to me. So we'll, we'll, see, we'll see where it lands. Cool. Yeah. Uh, as a, a lover of board games that are cooperative, I encounter a lot of issues with kind of alpha gaming and stuff like that that we yeah. all kind of know about. What are some things you did to avoid those in your game? Uh, the timer. The, the timer was a, a really big thing. Actually, for the longest time, if we knew that we were going to do uh, a cooperative game, the one thing, the only thing that we had to solve was, was quarterbacking. It was like a, a really prominent thing in the, in, the, in the back of all of our minds because we, we see it as kind of a, you know, a, a problem with the space right now, I guess. And, and I, I was really driving on like really, like I went with like the Hanabi route where you like, you can't show stuff and, and like we thought of all these really kind of just detrimental ways to kind of uh, remove the ability for someone to have quarterbacking in, in that agency. But what we ended up doing uh, and Rick talked me out of this. He, he, was, he was spot on. He was like, let's just for like a week or two not worry about quarterbacking and look to add more collaboration, more opportunities for, for, for you want to engage with, with your teammates. And that actually made for a much more fun experience. Uh, so in solving that problem, I actually made the game much, much worse. And, and I'm glad that he came in to kind of right the ship there. Uh, but I do think that the timer and also maybe the complexity of, of the individual puzzle for each player kind of makes that difficult to, to be, to feel like you are the, you know, the aficionado on every other person's thing because the, the, the decision space there is pretty rich. Cool. And as a last one, with cool. Abby being a great game, what are other inspirational games for you, cooperative? What? Uh, what? Other favorite cooperative board games? Oh, gosh. There, the, there's a long list. Pandemic Legacy, I think, is, is, is huge. I, uh, Robinson Crusoe. Hanabi, uh, like I, I, I could go on and on. Like, it, yeah, it's such a rich space. All right, thank you guys very much. Uh, I was blessed. Thanks. <laughs>